So yeah. All right, let's talk about clouds. So clouds, we're gonna talk about their formation. <clears throat> clouds are named after a couple of different things. Um, they're named after their shape. They're named after their altitude. And again, I have more than one video on clouds posted to your canvas that should help you in understanding clouds. But one thing I wanna note is that clouds weren't classified until this person came along, Luke Howard, early 19th century. He was young, he was walking around in a world where people only referred to clouds as essences. So they only, they didn't think about clouds. Clouds are a huge part of our weather system and our climate. And people didn't classify them, they didn't know why they formed. And so he's the first person who started classifying them. He called them clouds, which I've always wondered. I think if I classified clouds, I would have named them after myself, but that's just me. <clears throat> and he's 20 when he presents this paper, by the way. So watch the cloud video and let's go over how clouds form. So first of all, you have air that's rising. In a high pressure system, you do not see clouds. Why would that be? Because air is sinking and in order for a cloud to form, air has to rise. So if air is sinking, water vapor can't rise in the atmosphere and form a cloud. So a cloud forms in a low pressure system, first of all. So clouds form in low pressure system. High pressure systems push air down, so they don't allow water vapor to rise. You have air parcels that are rising with water vapor in them, first thing. So we know that when air rises, it condenses. <clears throat> all right. One Particular thing you need for a cloud though is what's called a condensation nuclei. So condensation nucleus or condensation nuclei is a little piece of solid matter. It could be an aerosol, it could be a piece of dust. It's something that's in the atmosphere that, that, that those rising air parcels condense around. So you need rising air with water vapor. You need a condensation nuclei, something in the atmosphere that that rising air condenses around. Okay. So clouds are collections of water droplets and ice crystals. They form when moist air rises and encounters cool air or it cools down itself is essentially what happens. Uh, and remember, we have different types of clouds that are going to form. So we have different ways that air lifts. So if air lifts differently, clouds are going to form differently, right? If, if clouds are formed with water vapor and lifting air and air lifts in different ways, then clouds are going to be formed and form different types of clouds. All right, so think a hot day, you pour some water on asphalt, what's gonna happen? That water, you can like literally see the steam rise. That's what's happening in our atmosphere all around us all the time. Not quite at the intensity of like pouring water on a hot surface on a hot day where you see steam rise, but what's happening in our atmosphere is air is rising with water vapor inside of it. It cools as it goes up in the atmosphere, condenses. If you have a condensation nuclei, some kind of aerosol or speck of dust or something, that, that water vapor and those air parcels can condense around that condensation nuclei. Um, all right, so clouds are classified in Latin, and that's one of the reasons that they can be kind of intimidating when you start to learn cloud names. But if you know what the cloud names or the words are in Latin, it's not actually that intimidating. So cumulus is a Latin word. It means heap or pile, basically just heap or pile, cumulus. So just imagine if you hear the word cumulus around a cloud, what do you think it's gonna look like? It's gonna be one of those clouds that looks like a big fluffy pile of cotton or something like that. Stratus in Latin means layer. So imagine a stratus cloud now. Remember I said nimbostratus clouds are those clouds that look like a sheet of just like dark gray cloud and you know that it's probably gonna rain. So stratus means layer in Latin. Cirrus means wispy. So if you've heard of a cirrus cloud, just imagine it would be like one of those wispy clouds. Sometimes they're called horse tails because they kind of look like whipping horse tails in the atmosphere. And then nimbus means rain in Latin. So if you see the word nimbus attached to any cloud, what kind of cloud is it? A rain cloud. The other thing that clouds are classified by is their height. So if you are high up in the atmosphere, 20,000 feet or above, we're talking about a zero cloud, zero. So zero means high in Latin. Um, <clears throat> and then mid-level clouds, those are alto. If you've ever been in choir, if you've ever been like a, 
a musician of any type, you know that there's alto, soprano, see that one? The really bass. <laughs> um, so alto, if you're in choir, if you're an alto sax, you're a mid-level sax player, right? Um, so alto means mid in Latin, and then low level, stratus. So low level down here. Again, it has to do with the word layer, but in terms of cloud classification, stratus in uh, how high it is, stratus is low. So it's layered, it's low. <clears throat> all right. So look at all of our different clouds. Remember, they're classified by height and they're classified by shape. So we have our high clouds up here. What would our high clouds be called? Zero clouds. Um, so up here, 20,000 feet or above, we have our zero clouds. Uh, we have our mid-level clouds. Remember what those are gonna be called? Boom, alto. Uh, and then we have our low-level clouds, our strato clouds, our stratus clouds, way down here, like 5,000 feet. You know, the kinds of clouds you could hike to. <clears throat> and um, we put together the shape and the height, so we have our alto cumulus. What would alto cumulus be? It would be a mid-level fluffy cloud. Remember, cumulus means pile. So our alto cumulus over here is that's your mid-level fluffy cloud. You know, you're like at a picnic, you're lying down looking at the clouds, you and your partner or whoever are looking at the clouds, you're like, what do you see? I'm like, I see. Ronald Reagan, and you're like, this relationship is over if you see Ronald Reagan, um, et cetera, et cetera. Cumulonimbus cloud, that's your stormy cloud, your thunder cloud, your cloud that gets lightning. Uh, cumulonimbus cloud, cumulus, remember, means fluffy pile, and nimbus means rain, so that's gonna be a fluffy rain cloud. <clears throat> cumulonimbus clouds usually go through multiple different layers of the atmosphere. So cumulonimbus clouds usually start at a low level and go all the way up to high level clouds. So those are the kinds of clouds you might see that just like seem to go way up in the atmosphere. All right, cumulus clouds, those are also, also called fair weather clouds. Those are the kinds of clouds, again, that you would see at a picnic, looking up at the sky, if you've ever drawn like some idyllic, you know, I don't know, if you were in fifth grade or something, you had to draw something with like a house and little fluffy clouds, those would be cumulus clouds. So how do clouds form? Remember, different types of lifting are gonna lead to different types of clouds. So convection, intense heating of land, air rises up, condenses around a condensation nuclei, and boom, we have a convection cloud. Lifting is when you're going to have two different air masses. Remember, cool and warm. Cool's all dense, warm's all flopped out. That cool runs into the warm, lifts that air up over. Um, that's going to lead to like your flat stratus clouds. Basically, if you imagine you have your warm air just floating, hanging out here, and here comes the cool air. And as that cool air just like bashes into the warm air, it's going to lead to, as it, so as it lifts that warm air, you're going to see a cloud form as it moves along. Does that make sense? So like your, your, um, your clouds that result from frontal lifting are usually like your flat clouds. Because if you imagine, here comes the cold air, it hits the warm air, that warm air gets pushed up, let's say to, I don't know, 15,000, 10,000 feet. And so now we have this cloud that's formed in this kind of flat way as the cool air runs under the warm air. Does that make sense? So that's our frontal activity. <clears throat> lifting that occurs when you have um, mountains, if you remember that's orographic lifting. And then convergence, when two air masses run into each other and go up. So we went over this already, but just so that you can see it kind of written out. There you go, and then there's fog. Fog is a cloud that's a result of a microclimate. So a cloud that's a result of a microclimate. We are very familiar with fog here in Southern California. We get fog, we get a type of fog called advectional fog. So fog is going to be the result of guess what? Guess what? What's my favorite thing in the world besides cats and my daughter? A convection cell. So they're a result of a convection cell. <clears throat> Don't tell my dog I just said that. Um, 
So I'm going to try something that I figured out I can do. Yeah. Now, if you remember me drawing in class, I'm not good at it. But this is what I would draw on our chalkboard in class. So imagine that's a mountain, a valley. No, stop that. Let's do it here, the whole thing. All right. <clears throat> See, we have a mountain, then we have a valley. Oh, mm, mm, that's a good valley. And then we have a mountain, and then we go down. And that is going to be the shore. Here's the ocean. Guys, we're getting so high tech now. This is the ocean over here. Ocean. Let's do OC, not for Orange County, but for the ocean. And remember that, the, er, not remember, imagine that this is Santa Barbara right here, where we live and go to school. Maybe we don't live here, but we go to school here. Santa Barbara, and then let's say this is San Ynez Valley. Santa Ynez. Er, er. All right. <clears throat> so, what's happening? When do we get fog? When do we get fog? May and June, right? They even have cute little names for it. May gray, June gloom, it's high tech, um, like my drawings. All right. So, if you remember, if you remember, air and temperature changes at different times of the year because rock has a what? Low specific heat capacity and water has a what? High specific heat capacity. So <clears throat> what starts to happen around springtime, right around now, is, and this is difficult to say because we have been in a heat wave the last couple of days, but we will get into May gloom and or May gray and June gloom pretty soon. And what's going to essentially happen is Santa Inez, which I think is actually a little bit cooler than Santa Barbara right now, <clears throat> but this is a, a weather anomaly, what's happening to us right now. So Santa Inez is going to start to see temperatures rise much faster. San Ynez has been much cooler during the winter. San Ynez gets down into freezing cold temperatures at night and is pretty cool during the winter. And then it's much hotter than Santa Barbara in the summer, right? That's because it's inland, because it's not being, the temperature isn't being regulated by our cool ocean. So what's gonna start to happen in May is that we're going to see temperatures rising in San Ynez during the day. The sun's gonna come up. Let's draw a sun. Look at that. Here comes the sun, you guys. It's a good book, by the way. Here comes the sun, if you've ever read it. It has everything. Jamaica, queer women, other stuff. Um, <clears throat> it's a very good book. All right, here comes the sun. So the sun is heating up the valley. The valley has a low specific heat capacity, so the air is going to rise, but then the sun's going to go down. And when the sun goes down at night, the temperature in San Ynez is going to drop very quickly. So all day the temperature has been rising. So you have this warm, warm mass of air sitting over San Ynez during the day. And then the sun goes down. Sun goes down and the temperature in San Ynez is going to drop. It's going to get very cool down here in the valley, down here. All right. But over here in Santa Barbara, it's taken longer to get warmer. So the sun came up, we're next to a cold ocean. So it took us longer. In fact, it probably took like most of the day for the temperature to rise in Santa Barbara. So while the temperature rose in San Ynez and just kind of shot up very early in the day, it took us a while to heat up over here. So then when the sun goes down, San Ynez cools down right away. But again, because we're next to the water, Santa Barbara has uh, is more temperate because of that water and water has a high specific heat capacity. So when the temperature drops in San Ynez, it's still going to be relatively warm over here in Santa Barbara. Now what happens? What happens when it's warmer over here is air from the valley is going to migrate over to Santa Barbara. So here comes the air from the valley at night. That warm air mass comes and sits over our cold ocean. So at night, the temperature in San Ynez drops 
the temperature stays relatively warm here in Santa Barbara. It's going to cool down eventually, but it cools down slower than San Ynez. So that warm, warm, mass, warm air mass makes its way over and sits over the ocean. Okay, so now you have a warm air mass sitting over the ocean. What kind of ocean do we have here? A cool ocean. It's a cool ocean current, right? We're on the west side of a continent. So with that cool ocean current, you now have a warm air mass sitting on top of cool air. So when that warm air mass sits on top of cool air, we have what's called a temperature inversion. Usually warm air down at the surface of the earth cools and cools and cools as it goes up in the atmosphere. But in this scenario, we have a warm air mass sitting over a cool air mass. We call that a heat inversion. Remember we talked about that last week. So now with that heat inversion, this cool air that's sitting over the ocean condenses. Basically that cool air rises and it gets kind of, kind of like, like it sits right in the middle of the warm air mass and the cold ocean so that you have this air that's sitting over the cold ocean and it's being kept there by this warm air mass. This warm air mass is like keeping this massive air over the ocean and what happens? It forms a low level cloud. So with that warm air mass sitting right here in this cool air over the ocean, that cool air basically sits in between the ocean and that warm air mass and it condenses. And when it condenses, it forms the low hanging cloud that we call fog. Yay, fog. There we go. And then what happens? What happens? The sun comes up again as it always does. And the temperature in the valley heats up again. And it takes it longer to heat up over here in Santa Barbara. So now the warm air is in the valley. And what does this air over the ocean do? It makes its way, it makes its way over to the valley, dragging this low level fog that we call, sorry, this low level cloud that we call fog. And that fog sits over Santa Barbara until it eventually makes its way up the mountain and burns off. You know how we say that the fog will burn off by this afternoon? That's what we mean. It basically gets pushed up over the, little tiny San Ynez, uh mountains that we have right here, and it burns off. Make sense? That is advection fog. That's what we get here. That's what we get in San Francisco. Advection fog. What does the word advection mean? Sideways movement. See how this is the sideways movement of air? And see how, is this, how it's a convection cell? Warm air rises, uh, sits over the valley, sun goes down, Air makes its way over to the relatively warmer Santa Barbara, sits over a cold ocean surface. That cold ocean surface traps, so the warm air mass and the cold ocean surface traps the air in between over the ocean under the warm air mass. That air condenses, forming a low level cloud that we call fog. And then the sun comes back up again. Air that is sitting over the ocean makes its way to the warm San Ynez air. And when it does, it pulls that fog cloud, sits over Santa Barbara until that fog cloud eventually gets pushed up over the mountains and burns off. That is our advectional fog. We have another type of fog. I know, I just cleared that away, it's so sad. That other type of fog is called radiation fog. For those of you who are from Sacramento or I don't know, Bakersfield, places like that, somewhere from the the valley you might have heard of radiation or tule fog. So what happens here is essentially the same thing, a little bit different. So we're in the valley. Once again, and in this valley, we're talking about the Great Valley. We're talking about Bakersfield, Fresno, that kind of place. You know that Fresno used to have a tourist campaign that went Fresno, Fres yes. Creative. We had some people straight from Mad Men on that marketing campaign. <clears throat> All right, so valley, Bakersfield. The sun comes up. It gets hot AF, right? It's Bakersfield. The air heats up over the valley, rises up. You got this warm air mass and it gets trapped by the, by the majestic, gigantic valley, right? And so now you have this warm air mass that's just sitting over the great valley. And what happens? The sun goes down low specific heat capacity of the valley means that the temperature 
drops down pretty fast. So now you have this warm air mass that's trapped by the valley sitting over relatively cooler air down at the valley floor. What do we call that? A heat inversion. That heat inversion leads to a low hanging cloud that we call fog. This is radiation fog though, not advection fog. The difference is that advection fog forms over an ocean, gets pulled sideways. So that advection fog is the kind of fog that we would see here in Santa Barbara and San Francisco, whereas Thule fog, radiation fog, forms in a valley, and it's the kind of fog that we would see in Bakersfield, Fresno, Fresies, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, hello. Um, okay, let's go back to this. <clears throat> I hope you found that as exciting as I do. It's a convection cell. <clears throat> so radiation fog, where would we find that? Valley, Thule fog, Bakersfield, advection fog, that's what we would find in Santa Barbara, San Francisco, sea fog, here's some pictures. This would be your advection fog. Oh, that's Sydney, you guys. Look, that's the Sydney Harbor Bridge. My grandfather worked on that bridge. <clears throat> the same grandfather that gave all my grandmother's jewelry to prostitutes as payment. They also built this bridge. Okay, he didn't build it, he worked on it. Advection, radiation. Look at that, Great Valley, look at that. It's basically just like a big fog cloud, just right in the middle of the valley there. And then you got a little advection fog to the side here in San Francisco. Thule fog, some people describe it as looking like it almost like forms right out of the surface of the earth, basically. Some people say like it looks almost like the cloud comes like right out of the road. All right, so this, if you remember, we talked about mountain breezes and valley breezes, but I wanted to bring us back to this because this is in fall why we get kind of the reverse. So with spring, we get this formation of fog here in Santa Barbara, this advection fog. Um, it's because of the difference in temperature between the valley and the Santa Barbara, the Santa Barbara, the coast, the valley heating up warmer, much faster during the day, Santa Barbara taking longer to heat up. Now think about fall. Fall is essentially the opposite. By the time fall has come along, Santa Barbara has finally gotten into its summer. Really, we get our summer in like, and this is true in San Francisco for sure as well, we get our summer in like August, September, October. Um, whereas the valley in San Ynez, they're going to go into fall. It's going to start to cool down there much faster. So what we're going to get is basically a reversal of that fog pattern, a reversal of instead of the whole thing I just described where the air in the valley is hotter during the day and the convection cell that happens, now we're going to have the opposite where the temperature is going to go down faster in the valley, but it's still relatively warm out here on the coast. And so what that leads to is this air that's been sitting in the valley, just like hot all summer, just horribly hot, is going to, once fall comes along, now it's warmer in Santa Barbara, cooler in the valley, so that air is gonna make its way up over, over the San Inez Mountains, over to Santa Barbara, it's going to happen more in the evening especially because that's when, as you get into the afternoon and into the evening, that's when temperature in the San Inez Valley is gonna get really cool, whereas it's still gonna be pretty warm over here in Santa Barbara. That air mass that's gonna make its way over the San Inez Mountains into Santa Barbara is gonna release what we call latent heat. If you remember, I went over those different types of heat. Latent heat is the type of heat that happens when you transfer heat from, let's say, vapor to, um, water or from water to vapor. Basically you have this release of heat that's being stored in gas. <clears throat> and so as that air comes up over the San Inez Mountains from the valley and rains down on Santa Barbara, it's bringing all this heat that it's been storing all summer leading to this hot, dry air. When that hot, dry air hits the mountains of San Inez and the mountains of Santa Barbara after our long, dry summer, you basically have a fire because you're, you're hitting the side of a mountain that has gone through a long dry summer. We have dry summers here and wet winters. Um, so that warm air hitting a dry mountainside, it's basically just kindling and boom, that's when we get our fires. <laughs> like how easily I said that, that's how we get our fires. <laughs> you know, the ones that destroy entire uh, landscapes. 
Um, we call those winds Chinook winds, if you remember, Santa, Santa Ana winds. Uh, those are fire starters. It's all happen here in fall because of kind of a reversal of what we just talked about with fog. Okay. And then other things that happen with rain precipitation <clears throat> is acid rain. So as we put more chemicals into the atmosphere, because you know that we're burning carbon locked sunlight um, and we're spewing that carbon that's been stored inside the earth into the atmosphere, we send a lot of other chemicals up into the atmosphere as well. And those chemicals, when air rises, water vapor condenses, it's going to absorb those chemicals and they're going to come back down with the rain. So what we've seen is an increase in what we call acid rain, acidic rain. It's basically rain that's been in, if you remember, um, uh, carbonic acid is when you have rain that goes through the soil, absorbs the carbon that's stored in soil, hits limestone. What does it do? It erodes that limestone leading to the huge underground caverns that we see in, see in places like the Yucatan Peninsula, in Borneo. Remember we watched videos on that. Um, so other things besides carbon are also going to be absorbed into our water vapor and into our rain that can have a corrosive effect. And we see the effects of that not just on buildings, but also on trees, on our natural landscape as well. Damage to soils, damage to buildings, damage to forest, and all of that is 100% preventable if we just stopped putting that shit into the atmosphere. Different types of lifting, once again, just to remind you, or graphic, convergent, frontal, and then to remind you of what humidity is or where we're going to see high humidity and low humidity. Death Valley is where we're gonna see some of the lowest humidity in the world. Basically what's happening there, oh, we can go back to my whiteboard. Just figured out how to use this. Things we learn. <clears throat> Look at that pretty picture. Okay, clear that crap off here. All right. I was just gonna draw. Oh yeah. Okay, so, so California <clears throat> is basically a series of mountains and valleys. If this is the ocean over here, once again, we'll do O for ocean. Um, and we've got, let's imagine that's Santa Barbara, and then we go up to San Inez, and then there's San Inez Valley, and then there's more mountains, and then there's the Great Valley, you know, Bakersfield, all that good stuff. And then we get into the majestic Sierra Nevada. Ooh, 14,000 feet at its highest peak. It's not quite that steep in that picture. And then we go over to the Eastern Sierra. So the Eastern Sierra, if you've ever gone along the 395, oh my God, the I'm even wearing a June Lake shirt right now. That's on the 395. <clears throat> so if you've gone to the 395 along the 395, if you've gone on the Eastern Sierra field trip, if you've gone on the Death Valley field trip, or you were gonna go this semester, but it got canceled, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> then you'll see how dry it is over there. Why would it be dry? You should figure that out. Orographic lifting. All right, but then we get to Death Valley, which is the lowest point in North America, has some of the hottest recorded temperatures anywhere in the world. And Death Valley is, if you noticed, if we imagine this is a D and a V for Death Valley, and this is the ocean over here. If you notice, Death Valley is lower than sea level. And you probably already knew that, but looking at this picture, that wasn't an accident. Death Valley is lower than the sea level. Okay, so what happens to air? It starts over here, it's all wet from the ocean, and makes its way over the San Inez Mountains. We know that it dries out a little bit, makes its way over into the valley. It's gonna dip down again, it's gonna get really warm because it's in Bakersfield. It's gonna make its way up over the majestic Sierra. Look at that, how much orographic lifting do we have here? Imagine the condensation that's gonna happen. Imagine how dry that air is gonna get from it basically like, imagine the air went over the sand in those mountains, got squeezed out of a little bit of water vapor, and then goes along the dry ass central valley, <clears throat> gets warmer, gets dried out a little bit more, makes its way up over these incredible Sierra Nevada. Now basically just imagine that like the air is literally being like ringed of any water vapor. It's all gonna be left in the Western Sierra. So when this air makes its way over into the Eastern Sierra, 
to like the 395 places like that, it's going to drop and drop and drop. And what happens to air when it goes down in elevation? It adiabatically heats, right? But it lost all its water vapor over here on this side of the mountain. So it's going to drop. And because Death Valley through extension, which is where basically you have North America being pulled apart. So there's an even like deeper valley. It goes below the sea level. What's going to happen is that air is going to continue to adiabatically heat and it's going to be dry, 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 dry at heat. And it's going to heat more and more and adiabatically heat more. And just imagine how warm and dry it's going to be by the time it gets to the bottom of Death Valley. That's why Death Valley is so freaking dry. <laughs>